the people in the church still gave to the Lord. They still were generous. They still showed up here. But you all, not just showing up, but you were also giving of your tithes and your offerings. And for a lot of churches right now, that's a big deal. There are some churches right now that have closed their doors because they can't afford to pay the minister. They can't afford to keep the lights on. They just can't do it. So the churches are closing their doors. Not only have we kept our doors open, but we have been doing different things around the church like fixing um, all of our air conditioners, which right now doesn't mean much, but as soon as summer comes, it will mean a lot. Um, we've, they've worked on the heater system right down there with the boiler room. But the biggest thing for me is we have got a brand new baptistry, and it is completely finished. I know a lot of you have been waiting for this, so we're going to do our big reveal. And as he's opening this up, I love it because now you'll be able to see whoever's getting baptized through the window. Yes, that's... And here's the thing, as we've got this new baptistry, we've been waiting a long time, and I'm just going to assume that everyone's just been waiting for the baptistry to be ready to start telling people about Jesus, but... Here's the thing, I'm not saying this to say we need to get our numbers up, but we have a new baptistry and there are, like Mark said, there are people who need to know about Jesus. And maybe you've been waiting and we don't need to wait anymore. And we're going to talk more about that here in a little bit, but I want to encourage you. First off, thank you for giving. Because of your giving, we were able to do this. We were able to do so much more. We were able to keep our building in great shape so that we can bring more people into it, so that we can keep going on to 2021. So thank you for what you have done, but I want to encourage you, let us keep moving forward. Not just in giving of your time or of your offering, but let's move forward in giving of your time. Let's move forward in the giving of your prayers, giving of your comfort. Let's start doing that more and more. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we come right now. As many of us have already given our offerings today and we continue to give our offerings weekly, Lord, as our way of worshiping. Lord, all this stuff we've done to the building, the new baptistry, it's not for us. It's not to say, oh, look what we've done, pat on our backs. Lord, we do this for you. We want to come back and say thank you for the love you've given us. Thank you for the blessings you've given us. Lord, you are good. And your love endures forever. And because of that, we want to give back. We want to show our appreciation and our worship through what we give, Lord. And we pray that what we have given is given with cheerful hearts and excitement for what you're going to do with it next, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope everyone had a great Christmas and that uh, moms and dads, I hope you got some sleep this weekend. Um, I know the excitement of everything Christmas Eve and Christmas morning, but then I know the toys that come. Sometimes it's hard to get kids to go to sleep. But the other thing is, I think this year, and this time of year even, is focused so much on waiting. And Mark hit that a little bit there. And I think for kids, the waiting is the anticipation of the presents and everything. So for the kids, that's happened. But now, the adults begin to wait. And uh, I've thought about some of the things that we wait on. And um, this year, more than other years, um, adults are waiting on a vaccine or waiting for things to get back to normal. But other things we wait on, and I think these are more important than those things, um, some of the more important things to wait on are the batteries to die in that very noisy toy that your kids or grandkids received on Christmas morning. Um, some of us are waiting for January 1st to get here so that we can start our New Year's resolutions because you're not allowed to start them till the new year. So no matter what I preach today, don't start it till January 1st. That's, I'm being funny. That's not real. Um, you can start it tonight or right after service. 
waiting for our new diets and exercises to start working after all the food we ate this weekend. Some parents are waiting for school to start again. There just seems to be a lot to wait for right now. We know it's coming, and we know what we're hoping and waiting for will come, but not quite yet. Even in our faith, we're told to wait sometimes. How often do we pay, pray specifically to the Lord, and then we have to wait for his timing to give his answer? Or even things promised to us by God, we have to wait on. How many of you have come to Christ and said, I believe in Christ, I want to follow Christ, and he says, all right, I will give you the gift of eternal life. But in that gift of eternal life, you have to wait till I come back. How many of us are waiting in anticipation for the day Christ returns? But we have to wait. Continually waiting. What are you supposed to do while you wait? If you have to wait for something, what do you do? I don't know if you're like me, but when I'm told to wait, I sit there almost confused about what to do. I struggle with waiting because once I start to wait, I start to worry. Is it really coming? And you'll see me, and my wife gets mad at me, because you'll see me pace like this back and forth at the house. It's gotten better. It used to be really bad, but I would just pace and pace whenever I had to wait. And I'd get really worried and nervous. And then other people sit there and they go, well, got to wait. Okay, and they just sit there and twiddle their thumbs. And yes, I worked really hard to get this because I could not do it earlier. Others will sit there and play video games. Others will sit there and just do nothing, uh, take a nap. But what do you do when you wait besides just sitting there and worrying? Today, we're going to look at two separate scriptures. One is going to explain how to wait while the other illustrates how to wait. We're going to be in John chapter 14 and Luke chapter 2. So if you got a paper or you got your bulletin, put it in one. Uh, we're going to be starting off in John chapter 14, and we're going to look at what Christ said to his apostles, the importance of asking before we wait. If you're in John chapter 14, if you'll stand with me, we're going to read verses 13 through 14 together. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. You may be seated. See, the first thing we have to do in order to wait is you have to ask for something. Because how goofy would we look if we're sitting there and I'm sitting there and you see me twiddling my thumbs and you can tell I'm waiting on something and you say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm waiting. But well, what are you waiting on? I don't know. But I'm sure I'm waiting on something. How goofy would that sound? How many would you think that I had lost it and maybe had too much fruitcake over Christmas season? Yeah. Yeah, he did. So here's the deal. We have to ask first. If you notice what Christ said, he didn't say you have to ask me for what you want. He said, ask in my name, and he said it twice. Let me ask you something. If somebody says something twice, you should probably take notice, right? If someone repeats themselves, it's probably very, very important. And that is what Jesus says. He says, what Whatever you ask in my name, I will do. In Matthew, Christ is saying, ask and it will be given to you. But there's a caveat. He did not say, ask whatever you personally want, but ask in Christ's name. You see, when we ask in Christ's name, this means we need to ask for things that will bring Christ glory. We need to ask for things like help in witnessing to others. Ask for things like strength during temptations. Figuring out what would glorify God in a certain situation. 
what would bring him glory. The ultimate request, though, that I believe that we all have to ask first is for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life when Christ comes back. Christ says, if we ask for these things, we will get them. But he doesn't say you'll get them immediately. He says you'll get them, but sometimes we have to wait on God's timing. So how do you wait? In Luke chapter 2, there's a man named Simeon and a prophetess named Anna who exemplify what it looks like to wait on the Lord and to answer and to listen for the answer of God's prayers. The first thing that happens is in Luke 2, 25 through 27. It says this. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required. You see, the first step in waiting is that you can't just ask for something and then forget what you asked for. You have to know what you're looking for. You have to know what's coming. Simeon here knows he has asked God, please let me see the coming Messiah. And God has said, you will see the coming Messiah. You will see the glory of God come before you. Simeon knows and never forgets. He even went to the temple that day looking to see if this is the day God would answer his promise. In John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus makes his apostles, and even for us today, makes us aware of what we are truly waiting for. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, Would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. You see, Christ has told us what we're waiting for. He says he's coming back, so we need to make sure not to forget that. Because if we get to the point where we forget what we're waiting for, then the question I have to ask is do we truly believe or even want it to happen? If someone were to come for you and say, I've got got what I promised you, and you go, oh, I forgot forgot that that you even promised me that. Oh, I, I didn't realize this was coming. What does that normally do to the person that's giving that gift? They sit there and they go, oh, did they even want this? Was this really that important? If I'm giving, I've worked hard, I told them I'd get it to them, and they didn't even remember that I was going to give it to them? Then on our part, we've got to ask, if that was us, and we are getting this gift, how many of us, when we get that, will go, oh, this is cool, and then just throw it to the side, because it wasn't important to us in the first place. You see, if we don't make it important to continue to remember that Christ is coming back, that God will answer our prayers in any prayer we've asked. He's going to answer that. And if we don't remember those prayers, we, why, why are we asking for it? We need to believe that Christ will return and even that he will keep his promise to give us what we ask. Hebrews 11, 6, we're warned that we have, if we have to have faith in God, and we have to have faith that God is God and can and will answer our prayers. It says, anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So as we wait 
we need to believe and remember and be seeking for the answer to our prayers. We need to be constantly looking for God to answer our prayers. Looking for Christ to return. We need to make sure that our eyes are focused on what's important. And when our prayers are answered, the next part of waiting comes in. Luke 2, 28 through 32, Simeon's prayer is answered. And this is what happens. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. See, Simeon was ready for the answer and was ready for what would happen once his prayer was answered. Once Simeon finally got to see what he had been waiting for, the promised Messiah, He was ready for what was next. He knew that the only reason he was still alive was for this moment. And now that this moment has happened, he says, as you have promised, you may now dismiss me, your servant, in peace. He's ready to die. He says, now I've gotten what I've asked for. I said, keep me alive till that point. Now I can die. You see, Simeon knew that what he asked for, and he knew what he meant when his prayer was answered. How often as Christians do we ask God for something, but when it happens, we say, oh, wait, wait, I'm not ready. Or, wait, is that really what I was asking for? Oh, I forgot to read the fine print. Oh, I didn't realize it meant that. Oh, Witnessing to somebody means I've got to witness and then spend time with them after they get baptized. Ooh, I didn't sign up for that. I'm sorry, God. I'm not ready for the answer of this prayer yet. Oh, when I said I, I would follow you, that meant follow you every day. Oh, okay. Oh, when I said I'll accept the gift of eternal life, that means when I die, no matter when. Oh, so I could die today. Oh, I'm not ready for that. Uh, uh. Okay, you know what? Ah, you have to be ready. John 14, 4. Jesus makes sure that we know what is happening when we get what we're waiting for. He tells his apostles, and you know the way to where I am going. He says, you know where I'm going and you know how to get there. He's talking about getting to heaven. The next life. You know where I'm going and you know how to get there. And when I come back, that means everyone who follows me will leave this earth. I really think some of us, myself included, sometimes have to ask the question, because my wife and I had this conversation the other day. If Jesus came back today and said, you can come with me and live forever in heaven, or you can stay here with your kids, watch them grow up, watch them get married, watch them do all of this stuff, you can see your grandkids, which would you choose? Would you choose to go to heaven with God now, or to see your grandkids later? My wife and I, we talked about it, and I'm blessed that I have an amazing wife because she said, oh, no, duh, we're going to heaven. I said, okay, good, yeah, yeah, me too, yeah. But where are you, what would you say if you were given that option? Do you know what you are saying when you say, "I, I want Christ to come back? Are you ready for what's coming? If you know what, when you say, I'm ready to witness, are you prepared for all of it? And as I say this, The excitement and the blessing of all of these answered prayers is better than the other option. Yes, 
seeing my grandkids would be great. But as it's said, yes, seeing my grandkids would be great. But as it's said, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. For me, if I were to die, if I were to go to heaven today, if Christ came back for me today, it's worth it. The other thing, too, is we need to be willing to use what God gives us. If we ask for strength, we need to use the strength he's given us. If you ask for wisdom, use the wisdom he gives you. If you ask to be a part of his family through forgiveness and inheritance of eternal life, you need to be ready for when Christ comes back. But you also, when you ask to be part of that family, be willing to accept being a part of that family. If you ask to be a part and you say, God, I want to be a part of your family, I'm going to plug in and I want to be a part of the family at First Church of Christ in Covington, then you need to be willing to be a part of that family. Not just say, okay, I'm there, I'll send a Christmas card, I'll, I'll, I'll send my tithe in, or I'll do this. You need to be a part, interactive. We talked about this in Ephesians back in September and October. You need to be united together with all the brothers and sisters here at First Church of Christ. If you ask for it, you need to use what God gives you. You need to be ready. But here's the big question. How do you get ready? And this is, this is the big part of waiting. Because as we wait, we look, we seek we need to be ready, but how do you get ready to use the gift that God's going to give you? How do we get ready for that? In Luke 2, 36 through 37, we're introduced to a prophetess named Anna. And the writer of Luke describes what she is doing to get ready when he says in verse 36, there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then was a widow, or 70 years, sorry. Then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. You see, Anna, as she was waiting for the Lord to take her, spent every day in God's house, worshiping him, fasting, and praying. She spent time in his word. She spent time worshiping. She spent time praying. She was preparing her heart for the Lord. She didn't pace around or sit around doing nothing. She didn't sit and complain about waiting or worrying about how long or if she's ready. Instead, she got ready and stayed ready by not only worshiping and praying, but by fasting. Now, here is the deal. A lot of us will get ready. But once you get ready and you're ready to go, especially when you were younger, even now as an adult, if your wife, especially as men, if your wife says, all right, we're going to leave in 10 minutes, and you get your coat on, and then you look at your watch, and 20 minutes later, she's still not quite ready. Because they have to make sure they're extra beautiful for you. That's what they're doing it for. Extra beautiful for you for day and night. So you're sitting there and you're going, well, eh, it's been 20 minutes. I'm going to go and take my coat off. Eh, I'm going to go and take my shoes off. What happens immediately? She comes in and says, all right, let's walk out the door. And she's got her coat on and everything already. Oh, oh, yeah, okay, and you get your shoes on, and you put your coat on real quick. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not important just to get ready, but you have to stay ready. And that's what Anna is doing. She is staying ready. She is going, and she is in the temple night and day. She even says that she's fasting. Now, for some of us, we would think fasting means she doesn't eat ever. But in the Jewish tradition, she would not eat until the sun went down. Once the sun went down, she would eat. 
But this was done so that every second of the day the sun was up, she would spend it worshiping the Lord and keeping her focus on God, not even stopping to think about food. All she did during the day was focus on God. In John 14, Jesus, in his conversation with the apostles, answered a question from Thomas about where Jesus was going and how to get there. But instead of directly answering the question, Jesus answers it in a roundabout way, but lets Thomas and us know what we should be spending our time doing as we wait on God. John 14, 5 through 7 says this, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. For now on, do know, you do know him and have seen him. See, what Jesus is saying here is in order to be ready for his return, in order to be ready for heaven, even to be ready for the answer to our prayers, we need to know God by knowing Jesus. This will allow us to know what to look for when God answers our prayers. If you know God, you know how God will answer it. As you get to know God and Jesus more, you know how he will give you wisdom. You know how he will make evident who you're supposed to talk to, how you're supposed to witness. But you have to know him first. You have to spend time with God. We need to know what God looks like. Because... If we look at Christ and we study Christ, we study his word, he says that he is the way. His life was lived as an example of the way to live. He said, I am the truth because he spoke the truth through his teachings. Everything that came out of his mouth was truth. And then he said, I am the life. See, in order to be ready, we need to follow Christ's example. We need to listen to his teachings, and we need to accept the life that comes through his death and resurrection. The only way to follow these things is to study them, to look at them, and spend time with God in worship through reading his word through singing praises to him, through being together with brothers and sisters in Christ, talking about what you're reading, talking about what God is doing. Because as you see God in others' lives, you'll get a bigger picture of who God is also. Over the next four months, we're going to look at Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. In January, we're going to look at Jesus as the way and learn from what he did while he was here on, his, on this earth. The things he did through baptism, the things he did through picking out his apostles, through being in the synagogue. We're going to look at all of those things through the month of January so that we can see how we can live like Christ. Then in February and March, we're going to dedicate ourselves to studying Christ's truth through what he taught. And in April, we're going to look at what the new life looks like in Christ because of his death and resurrection. I encourage you, as we come into this new year, let's get ready and stay ready for what the Lord has planned for us here at First Church of Christ. Let's be ready for when he comes back by studying, by diving in, and knowing Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. And as we get ready and we stay ready, we're told throughout God's word that no one knows the day or time but to always be ready. But when God answers your prayer, 
we need to take our cue from Anna. In Luke 2, 38, it says this. Coming up to them at that very moment, she, being Anna, gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. See, once you've received what you're waiting for, we need to be telling others about what God has done. Anna went around telling the news of the coming Messiah, not the coming, the Messiah had come and was here. She told it to anyone who would listen. We need to be doing the same. You see, how many of us in here were at the point of looking for hope or looking for joy? Who in this room was looking for love at one point in their life? Looking for fulfillment. Maybe you even just asked and prayed, I don't know if God's is really real, but I need something to fill, to fill me up. I need something to fill that dead space. I need someone to really love me. And did Christ come in and show you that love? Did he fill that space? Did he give you that joy? Did he give you what you were looking for? If he did... Have you told someone about it? If Christ has answered your prayers, and not just in that prayer, but if you have prayed, Lord, I pray that this brother or sister in the world comes to know you. Give me the strength to witness to them. And he gave you that strength and they came to Christ. Who are you telling about it? If you were going through a tough time and you said, God, give me the strength to get through this, and he gave you the strength, are you letting people know what God has done. Are there people out there who are going through a tough time that need to know that God can be there for them? If so, tell them. And I know that I've mentioned this several times and it may have been a focal point of last week's sermon. But I say it over and over again because this is important. Even in John 14, 12, Jesus declares, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. Jesus says as we wait for his return, because we've received answers to our prayers, we need to do his works. We need to build his kingdom. We need to spread the good news of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. You see, we have a new baptistry that we talked about. And it's waiting for people to accept that gift of grace, love, and life through faith and baptism in Christ. It's ready to be used. I got swimming trunks back there. I'm ready to put on. But here's the deal. You have to be telling people about him. And I joked, wait till January 1st. Don't wait till January 1st. Mark gave a great meditation. And in his meditation, he said, if you know of someone and God has put it on your heart, don't wait. See, here's the deal. When God gives you something, take it and use it now. If there is someone you need to talk to, go talk to them. If you have been looking and you're sitting in this room and you have not stepped up and accepted that gift of love and grace and eternal life from God, don't wait. He's willing to give it to you now. You don't have to wait anymore. Take what God is giving you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you right now thanking you. Thanking you for your love. Thanking you for your grace. Thanking you that you have said anytime you promise us something, we will get it. And Christ has said if we pray in his name, 
pray for things that will bring you glory, God. You will give it to us. And Lord, we love you and appreciate you so much for that. And I pray that today, what we have prayed for, what we have asked for from you, Lord, as we wait on it, we continue to study in your word, we continue to get ready, but we continue to look for those opportunities. We continue to look for ways that if we've been asking for someone to witness to, look for ways to witness to those people. If we've been asking for strength in tough times, that we're prepared to lean on you when those tough times come. If we've asked for wisdom, Lord, when you give us the wisdom, allow us to use it. Prepare our hearts so that we when we hear your words, when we see you working in our lives and answering our prayers, we'll use that as a testimony to tell others so that others may come to you, Lord. Thank you so much again for this gift of love and grace that came through Jesus Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to come and we're going to sing a song and as the praise team's coming up, I really encourage you, if you have not accepted that gift yet, if you have not and you've been waiting and looking for someone to love you, if you've been waiting and looking for fulfillment, this is that opportunity. It, the gift is here. Just come forward. And if you're sitting there and you've already accepted that gift, what have you prayed to God and asked for? Think about, has he started to show you it yet? And also, start to think, am I ready when God gives me this? If not, don't go back and say, oh, I don't want it. Instead, start to get ready. As we sing this song, prepare your hearts.